Before we get into this podcast, it is with a very heavy heart that I dedicate this in memory of Eddie Mather. Eddie was an Australian arborist working in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, when he tragically passed away. This is a recent tragedy and it's very close to home for me, so it's been top of my mind ever since it happened. Um, you know, I, because it's so close to home, you 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 know of people that knew Eddie. You you know people who work in the area, and you you kind of hear more about it. And it's you know it's on the local news, so uh, it's yeah it's very it's become very top of my mind, and um, it's it's an absolute tragedy. Eddie was only twenty five years old, I believe. Um, all of his family back in Australia uh, and I just can't imagine what his family and friends are going through right now so um, thoughts and prayers go out to them and um, yeah this podcast is in memory of Eddie Mother hey good to see you man yeah you too man yeah 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 it's been a while hasn't it it has it's probably uh well i've been here for three years so it'll wow. be three years coming up in february so, so where you live in stockholm yep yeah we uh we're um like right in the heart of it so it's kind of a unusual work yard it's like in the middle of a city it's in a parking garage underneath a five-story apartment block so probably nothing like that in Canada I don't think there's a single piece of wood in this yard uh, it's just it's spotless it's just like uh, you know we got our truck and our chainsaw and like everything stays at the site so it's kind of a it's kind of a different way of doing things but uh, quite nice too in its own way so, yeah yeah it definitely sounds different <laughs> It's very yeah, different. different. That's what you get. Sounds... That's what you get when you have a, a German in charge with his efficiency and and uh, uh, spotless sort of expectations. So, yeah, it's uh, that's good. I mean, I I got to Stockholm in February 2018 uh, in the middle of a blizzard and basically started working a week later. Uh, that's uh that's kind of uh thanks to chris hadley and uh isaac and they'd all worked here before so they put me in touch with uh with nordic tree care and uh basically just hit the ground running uh, as soon as i got here so um that was sort of uh, that was sort of it i guess uh, for the last couple of years just just working a lot and uh you know trying to make trying to make a new life for myself in a new place and uh really feeling like a, an outsider for the first time in my life like i'd always yeah I th even when i came to vancouver i i just knew so many people there i, I didn't really I, it wasn't like such a fresh start for me it was always like you know because i'd been tree planting in years past a lot of those people just ended up in bc and in the lower mainland so kind of uh always had a bit of a a network and then arrived here and was really just like grasping for straws anybody who would like you know stop and chat was a potential friend so you know you yeah. kind of have to like work it up from there and then i mean as you guys all know i know uh like you brits in vancouver you stuck together pretty tight and in part of that's just like i mean the people you're gonna have the most in common with is your co-workers and tree guys we you know so yeah, I guess like my colleagues and stuff were, you know, instant buddies. So uh, yeah, that that always pays like that. Yeah, that plays out pretty well. And did you um, did you had your plans to go to Sweden or something before, or was it was it just through talking with the guys that when you were working here at Bartlett no. or in, like it, here in Vancouver, and you just kind of 
almost started to get the itch to to go traveling or was it like, like a long term plan it, it was it's actually uh kyla my, my wife she she's the reason we're here and uh so she does research and she got a postdoc at the at the university in stockholm and like if i go back to 2016 uh even like 2015 when we were like you know a couple years in and and kind of serious there's always this sort of like specter looming that when she finished her phd she was going to try to go abroad and do a postdoc so i kind of always had this like in the back of my mind like i don't know we might end up somewhere else uh, at one point it was tasmania that she wanted to go so i was like for a couple of years i just remember thinking ah like i'll go to tasmania that'll be cool like Tasmania turned into Edinburgh and then Edinburgh turned into Sweden and Stockholm so I don't know it's just like yeah just random like that but uh I think when I when she decided when she started talking about Stockholm um I remembered that Isaac had worked here and I think I was out for beers with Hadley just a couple weeks later and and I started asking him about uh what the scene was like what it's like to find work what kind of work it is and i remember him telling me like uh <laughs> just in his sort of like calm kiwi way he's just uh, yeah mostly just uh castles and mansions and churchyards and stuff and i thought he was just pulling my leg i was like what do you mean castles and mansions and shit and it's like yeah it's like a lot of our clients are like are proper castles you know what that's like for a canadian guy who's like you know especially vancouver a hundred year old place is like ooh, that's ancient you know that's uh so now we're going around in some of these alleys that have been these alleys of tilia or something that have been the same alley for 400 years you know they replaced the trees as they die but you know you still have some uh you still have some ancient trees in that some veterans in, in that alleyway there so it's a different style of work for sure um it, it meant coming here like meant for me to really uh really like spruce up my climbing game again because uh i don't know if you remember i was working at the parks board for two years so oh that's right working. yeah 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 i, I was forgot the that. parks board i was uh, you know getting used to my coffee breaks and that was a, that was the life there so you know i i had dusted off my harness every other weekend and did like little side jobs and stuff like just to just to keep you know to keep fit and also because you know i love climbing so uh, uh that's a whole other it's a whole other bag of worms because i think when i started the parks board i expected to be climbing that was part of the you know that's what i was uh, applying yeah. for and then when yeah. i got there and realized like uh you're gonna be in a bucket truck every day for the rest of your 35 year career um kind of like clip my wings a bit and uh, uh yeah like i really don't think i climbed more than a dozen times over two years so anyways it was uh, it's kind of like leaving there uh coming here having to climb every day and some days like long days and you know lots of uh lots of uh like lots of, you know learning a lot about new techniques and techniques that i'd been aware of but hadn't really practiced techniques i'm sure like you know when i was working with you guys at bartlett for a bit stuff that was sort of in my in my view and i was trying to like absorb but hadn't fully gone down that route of of uh really looking into uh what sort of you know the, like where the industry was at in a way i think uh coming here really like you know uh really really spurred me into uh uh innovate or developing my skills again so um yeah it's, yeah, it was uh, a lot of fun. it's quite, it's quite so, must be quite strange going to going to europe and going to sweden after being working at the parks board where you'd you'd gone from climbing a, a relative amount to being completely suppressed in all of that climbing and being just made to use a bucket truck every day and then going back to somewhere where it's back in the trees again and and probably yeah. even like probably even turned up a notch to the next level almost 
It, I, I'd say so. I mean, yeah, I mean, it really did something to my spirit, I think, those years there. I mean, I got nothing against Park Sport. It's, uh, I, I mean, I, I really like it. There were a lot of things I really appreciated about my time there, and I did learn a lot. But uh, as far as climbing goes, yeah, I, I, it sort of set me back a few years. But, uh, you know, like I was always doing stuff. I was always climb, rock climbing and ski touring, and I was in good shape. So getting back into that side of it like working 45 hours sometimes a week was that wasn't really the hardest part i mean adapting to the new style of trees too you know it's uh we got a lot more broadleaf uh, uh or uh yeah like lots of large oaks and elms and beech trees uh which requires a different style of uh climbing than the conifers of the pacific northwest uh, so, you know, learning to use redirects again. And yeah, it's like, I knew that stuff. And I was like, you know, I was a competent climber, but I, I was uh, I was stuck on old systems. You know, I really had to get, broaden my outlook a bit. And, uh, you know, thankfully there's like lots of great people passing through this company and passing through Stockholm all the time. Uh, they're willing to teach you and, uh, you know, you put the money down and, get yourself some better kit and uh suddenly the job just opens up again it comes it's just something new it becomes fun um in ways that like yeah in ways that it just hadn't been before i guess part you know like to take it back a bit too when i started i started with like a pretty big company and they had their ways of uh issuing equipment so I didn't really grow up. I didn't really start in an environment that had a lot of where, where gear was like readily available and where experimenting and playing around with stuff was really encouraged, you know, and then slowly, uh, you know, mostly just because I working with you, you fellas uh, started to pick it up a bit. Um, but yeah, no, it was, a, it was, a, it was definitely an interesting uh uh, time, I think that first two seasons here, but uh, I guess that, I mean, yeah, just, that really uh, does. Just, uh, yep. just give us um, give, give a brief background on like <clears throat> where you started, when you started, like how you got into the game. Just like it doesn't have to be like in depth, but just so people listening can just can kind sure. of get a feel for how you started out in the industry and and like where your career took you up until getting into getting to sweden yeah okay so uh i'm from toronto and i started climbing well for for four summers while i was in university i would go to the bush every year and i, I was a tree planter um which i don't know how many listeners i mean in different parts of the world might not really understand what that carries but in uh in canada this uh it's popular summer job for young, for young people, university students. Often, you head off into the bush every May. Final exams are done. Sometimes, you know, I was working in out of Edmonton a lot, and then we would go to Jasper in the Rockies. Um, we would set up camp basically for three months. You're living in a tent. You take what the weather gives you. Every day it's piecework, so you're out there just like slogging uh spruce and uh fir and and pine and back into these clear cuts and uh you know you get paid 10 to 15 cents a tree uh the incentive is to plant 3,000 of these little these little pods every day if you do that you're making a bit of money and you go back you know like obviously you're living in the bush you're not really spending much money you buy beers and smokes and that was pretty much it uh but like good camaraderie, it was a fun job. And I, I mean, I wouldn't have uh, done it any other way. Like, it's, it's great. But, you know, when you, you, when you like, I guess when you develop that appreciation for work, um, like real work, like physical work, uh, there's not many jobs in, in the city that offer that, that sort of outlet, right? Like, what are you going to do? Like, you can... I mean, uh, rope access is all these like sort of associated trades that let you be so physical. And uh, so I don't know how I came. I was I was skiing in Nelson in the in the Kootenays and uh, I had a friend there 
who was an arborist and he showed me the gear and I don't think I'd ever seen it before. And this is probably 2010. And, uh, that winter, so 2009, 2010. And then I came back from tree planting that year. I got a job working for Davey, um, immediately decided, uh, they put me through the Humber college program, which is in, uh, Toronto. And it was a great two year apprenticeship for climbing. Uh, you know, you kind of like learn the background, you learn all the, you learn all the basic stuff, like the program, I don't know, it's probably gotten a lot more in depth and it's probably kept up with the times a lot more. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, we were learning how to climb on a Prusik and that was state of the art. So um, that's what I was doing. And then uh, two years working at Davy, came out to BC, that's where I met you. We were all working there together, big green machine. And then kind of uh, balanced around the industry a little bit in Vancouver. I worked for a couple companies and um, mostly, I mean, like at that point, yeah, I guess at that point, I think about my career as like, as much as I loved it, I was, it was still like this, it was still a job for me. And I, I was really enjoying all the other things about living in BC, which for me was skiing and uh, climbing and, and uh, mountaineering and everything else. So I, I don't think I really had the fire, like the, the passion, like so much in those kind of early years. Uh, then going to the, then uh, played, I, I worked for the, in the film business a little bit, um, doing like greens work, which was similar, you know, like car carrying props around, which were uh, uh, greens is like out it's like landscaping for film sets it's like the most wasteful thing i've ever experienced in my life literally showing up at nurseries with a pickup truck and a chainsaw and cutting down nursery trees to mount them onto a plywood board hustling them around film sets and uh using them until all the needles or leaves fell off and then you know get some more bring them back as i mean that was a it, that job was like not really for me and when that when an opportunity came up at the parks board i i applied and thinking that uh oh cool there's gonna they're bringing in 10 climbers to this parks board which is a it's a fairly it's you know for the listeners i guess um it's the municipal uh the forestry department for the city of vancouver and um it had always been a bit of an enigma to me because i'd see their trucks around but I never knew like anybody who worked there, right? Like it's you just, it seemed closed off from the rest of the industry. Um, so when I heard they were hiring 10 people, I thought, wow, this is gonna be like a big influx of, of young talent and people that are kind of passionate about trees. And I got, I got kind of excited and uh, well, anyways, it didn't quite pan out that way. I mean, such a big organization is gonna be, it's like trying to steer a oil tanker, like. You know, it's just very slow. Change happens at a glacial pace. So uh, props to guys like Paul Molyneux that are fucking plugging away out there and trying to make change happen. But it's uh, it's it's an uphill slog. So, um, but God, I mean, I, like, yeah, I guess uh, relevant to this conversation. When I started at Parks Board, my first month there. Uh, Jody Taylor died and he was a climber or he was a, uh, he was a tree tech. Uh, he was felling a large tree down in Kitsilano. Um, I mean, the circumstances of that are, uh, you know, fairly clear to me what happened. I think it was a case of, um, he hadn't been working, uh, he hadn't been working in the field much. Uh, I understand it for the year or two prior to being out. He had been kind of thrust back into the field, was maybe a bit rusty, uh, was maybe putting on a bit of a show for some of the new guys, uh, took, took some big pieces. And uh, yeah, that was really heavy. Man. And like, uh, yeah, that, is, uh, that kind of was a bit of a, it was a heavy way to enter a new, uh, a, a new position. Um, to sort of, you know, feel that grieving all around and everything that, and that never really, you know, that didn't ever really go away for, you know, six months, like, you know, um, 
kind of looms large over the parks board still, I suppose. Uh, anyway, um, but yeah, I worked for the parks board for a couple of years. I did some tree risk assessments in my last year and kind of got to develop a different, uh, try to develop a different set of skills. And, um, and then I came out here and, and then really tried to be like a, a Euro ace climber for uh, a, a couple of years. And, and then until my accident uh, last November. So it's, uh, it's, gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a year and two weeks um, since uh, uh, I busted my leg. So yeah, there we go. That takes, that's about a decade in a nutshell. But, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so what? Um, yeah. If you like, talk me through your accident because yeah. I don't know. Like, obviously, we we kind of messaged a, a small amount, but I don't know too much about what happened. So it'd be, I mean, super yeah. interesting for me to hear, like, kind of what, like, where your thoughts are at now. Like, now you've had time to to almost like think back about it and and maybe like dissect everything leading up to it and maybe on the day and if like i don't know where where if there were mistakes and like what led yeah, the accident what to, to happen yeah yeah um well so there were a few things that uh that were abnormal about this job uh, i think this is kind of a consistent thing with like accidents is they throw you off your routine. Um, for this one, it's actually kind of crazy, but uh, yeah. So my my wife's supervisor he lives in this pretty grand house in this uh, really affluent part of Stockholm, and he had us over for a Christmas party the year before. And was, you know, after dinner, we he takes me to the window and shows me this like. You know, I can see the silhouette of this big maple tree just kind of swaying in the wind. And he's like, oh, you know, I need this tree uh, to, you know, I need an arborist to have a look at this tree. And I said, sure, you know, I'll come by like in, in, the, in the spring and we can have a talk. Yeah, he didn't get in touch with me until September, but I went over and I met him on the site and I met him with two other colleagues of mine. And, um, and we both kind of like, you know, just kind of got the chills a bit. I, it's a... Uh, it was the big, big Acer Platinoides, uh, but it was just like a war horse of a tree. You could just, it had four limbs um, going out um, off in different directions, no central leader, um, bad inclusions in the bark at the, at the unions. Um, there was a, what they call um, lantica here. It's like, um, I don't even know the English word for it. It's like a white uh, fruiting body. Um, it's a heartwood decay or anyway. So we, we see this on the trunk. Everything about it just starts to give me the chills a bit. Had um, four, uh, it had four dynamic bracing slings like halfway up the crown, like way below where they ought to be. But they had probably been installed like a decade earlier and one of them had failed and so like it was just flapping in the wind and anyways i like um you know i took it back to my boss here tilo and we, we talked about it a bit and tried to plan how we would do it i mean it's also in a really it was in a really inaccessible place we couldn't get the truck in figured it needed to be climbed and I think immediately I put a lot of pressure on myself for for this job to bring it in for you know for my partner's boss really um and a guy who i had a degree of respect for and i was you know, like you know wanted to show that you know we're we're like one of the best companies doing this and you know i'm I'm a competent guy so i thought all right like just shake it off it's no worse than a lot of other trees i've done in the past you know it's uh so i i I basically I I brought the job in for us, which is like the only job I did that for last year. So I kind of stepped out of a sort of stepped out of my role on that one and and put a little more added pressure on my shoulders. And uh, we booked it for November twelfth um, last year. And just for everybody, like Stockholm in November is like an eerie kind of place. It's 
you know, the light doesn't really come out until eight quarter after eight this time of year. It's uh, sometimes you have these like really long fogs in the morning. Everything was just a little bit, everything was a little bit strange. Oh, I should also mention too, uh, October 17th is, was the, the birth of my son. So three weeks prior to this accident, I had a, a, a baby boy, my first baby, uh, first child. So, you know, a lot of like, that was, that was something in and of itself. I mean, suddenly going down to like four hours sleep and constantly this something on the back of your mind. Right. And it's like, it's like intense joy. And like, I was so happy, you know, like, but I, I wasn't really in my skin in the same way that, uh, you know, you should be when you're doing dangerous work. And, uh, one week before this job, I clipped my access line. Um, I used it to get up into a dead elm and it had draped over the back. And uh, I was just taking, we were just making a high stump out of this, this big old elm and uh, forgot that my access line was there. I wasn't on it. I was on my double line system. It was draped over a branch, but I couldn't see. And uh, yeah, so that was a bit of like, you know, that I should have started to realize that like my head was just out of it and uh um you know replaced my line got back to work whatever you know I started working again and uh when we got to this job uh, there were you know there were added stresses too so when we got there I had had this idea of how the job would go leading up to it and then a few little things just started to um fall apart at, at the site you know like we had i was going to use um i was going to use some large load binder straps around the base uh just around the lower part of the where the inclusion was um you know they didn't they didn't fit they weren't long enough so i tried to adapt something with some rigging line uh i was just a bit nervous about that crotch um so felt, managed to make something work, but then suddenly felt like I was an hour behind. Um, so tried to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, took down the first stem quite breezy, but on the stem where my actual accident happened. So it's leaning out at maybe a, I don't know, maybe like a 80 degree from the base. Um, I was tied in on an opposite branch. It would be easier to draw this, I suppose, but uh, not so good with the uh, with the the Google uh, or the. Well, no, um, you, like, um, why don't you like explain, and then maybe you can just yeah. draw draw a picture afterwards, and we can put it yeah. on a video or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so as a, I'm tied in with my double rope system, um, I'm, I'm on a pretty pretty steep angle, which was. In, in like to be fair in my opinion was the only working angle uh on that tree i was in the in the most central leader that i could be uh to work this thing and i so i'm working out on an angle i decide i'm there's a small shrub like i mean probably in hindsight wasn't worth saving but uh thought you know, if I'm going to do this job right, I'm, I'm not going to smash the ground up either. I'm going to rig everything out and I'm going to do this nice and tidy. I set the rigging, the block up in a fairly upright, maybe, um, let's say about 10 centimeter piece of maple. So the rope now, there's a bit of deflection on it because I got the porter wrap down on the ground or the GRCS running up at about an 80 degree angle. And now I've got a block up here, and then I go out on on a I go out on this limb, and I set up another uh, another smaller block um, as like a bit of a pick, and that's I was going to take the piece above that smaller block, and the intention at the time, I mean it's really hard for me to recall this because. I, I was not working in a in a very uh, typical in a usual manner for myself. I mean, I, I think back at that, and I think it was, like I was I was I was tired. I was like, you know, I was pushing through something I I really shouldn't have. Um, and uh, so I took I take this I took this limb 
um, with the intention that it would, uh, you know, I thought there, would, there was enough, there'd be enough friction uh, in the piece uh, or in the system uh, that it would come down smoothly. I called down to my groundman, my buddy Mickey. I, I told him to throw a wrap and a half on it. He does. Uh, I say, guys, I'm going to cut. And they both looked at me and gave me the thumbs up. And uh, I said, well, okay, I guess it's good. I uh, go for it and uh, put a notch in. And as I'm doing the back cut, uh, I see the piece. Uh, as I see the piece starting to go down, I saw it losing speed on its way to the ground. And it was a bit of a, that was like a bit of a, it's a crazy recollection because as soon as that piece that it just stopped like static it was a fairly large piece of maple and it just it, like there it just jammed and uh i heard a crack and before i knew it it was like getting hit with a wave and i was hanging upside down in my harness um and uh i was i was lanyarded into that piece uh where the block was but I knew something was wrong and I kind of lying there in a second just started with my head and started working my way down. Uh, I was like, okay, head's good, shoulders good, legs, torso good. And then I saw my left leg and it was just out at like an angle, you know, like broken at the knee and my boot was off to my left. And uh, I was like, shit, <laughs> fuck, you know, like what do you do? Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess that's, uh, you know, the adrenaline starts to pump. I, I was that, so the first, where the main block was that, that stem was super brittle. I didn't know that at the time it was still green. It had a lot of, um, I mean, yeah, like when I was doing a, like a brief assessment that day, I, you know, I. I, I determined that it was like a, it was a good piece to rig off of a piece that I probably would have rigged off of like, you know, 90 times out of 95 times out of a hundred sort of thing. Uh, when the crew who actually finished the job, um, when they came and talked to me in the hospital uh, and they told me what that piece looked like on the ground and how, how just decayed it was and like how um, it really, you know, struck me that like, you know, because, and we all know this, but because a tree has green, uh, is in leaf, um, tells you nothing about the internal structure of that wood. And that tree was, it was parched. You know, we had a big drought the year before and the wood just didn't have the same uh, capacity, the strength capacity uh, that I, that I get, gave it, you know, that I, uh, that I factored on. And um, so, that piece was now sort of resting on my, uh, so it was really messy, you know, as it is in a tree, like I'm hanging in my harness. This piece is pinned against me. There's a mess of ropes, like, you know, rigging lines, access or my double line. Um, it was just a really messy situation. And I think like that, one of the, you know, the probably that was that, that was a risky moment there. Like I think a lot of time, a lot of things could could have gone wrong and almost went wrong in the 10, 15 minutes it took for me to get down to the ground. And uh, so I, the first thing was con was making a, you know verbal contact with the grounds, um, getting an ambulance on the way. Um, one of my colleagues, Zoltan, a Hungarian fellow, he had his gear close by and he rushed to grab it and he said, man, he's like, I'm coming up. Like I'm coming up. I said, don't come up. Like there's a loose piece of wood, like a tr the size of a, you know, with, you know, 20 centimeter diameter chunk of wood or 10 centimeter chunk of wood resting on me. And I don't know how precariously. So um, let me sort this out first and then make your way. Right. So how, so that was how, kind of um, like, uh, I, on one hand, I'm kind of proud of myself about uh, how the, the next few moments went there. Like I, I managed to get the saw going. I cut that piece off. Uh, it, 
so that I could then, you know, heave it off my, my body, um, got my leg free. Um, uh, now I'm hanging in my system and I had this temptation to tie myself into the block that was sitting above me, which was like, I was just kind of panicked, but also like, you know, I'm thinking, I got all these things flashing in my head, like, you know, about my kid and just like, what the fuck am I doing up here? And, uh, I nearly tied myself into this block, which in hindsight would have just surely meant me plummeting to the ground. Cause, um, yeah, the, the end that I was grasping for and that I was trying to tie to my, 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 uh, bridge was the wrong end of rope. I wasn't thinking straight. And I, I nearly, I nearly tried to do this thinking that my friend Mikya had the other end that he could throw through the Porter app. I mean, it just defies like, like basic training, but in the moment I was just, I, I was terrified, you know? And uh, I, I, I think once I made that immediate connection, like Jesus Christ, it's the wrong end of rope. I just threw the whole rope down. Zoltan came speeding up the tree on his, in his spurs and uh, he tied, um, he set up another block. He lowered me down like super efficient. And by the time I got down, uh, the ambulance was there and they were able to like wheel a, uh, wheel a stretcher into the yard. And, uh, so I think it was somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes from when the accident occurred to when I got loaded onto that stretcher. And, uh, yeah, as soon as I got on that stretcher, like, just the pain just flooded in and like, you know, that adrenaline keeps you going for, for a while though. I mean like 10, 15 minutes, like I didn't feel any pain. I just wanted to get to the ground. Um, so then, uh, I'm on the, yeah, then I'm, I'm, I'm on the way to the hospital. I don't remember. I just passed out in the, in, in the ambulance. Like I was, you know, it was a mess. Um, so, I mean, I got to thank, like, I got to thank the fact that I had two good guys working with me um, that day. And, uh, you know, yeah, I like that. That scenario could have gone so many other ways. And I spent a lot of time uh, in the early recovery thinking about those scenarios a lot, like thinking about them to like the point of detriment to my own sort of you know best interest i was just kind of beating myself up about it and feeling like i had brought like a you know yeah you know, just kind of giving the industry a bad name and trying to bear like way too much for uh for the accident that you know you know I, yeah it's a it's a tricky thing i mean but again I, like i got I just got to be grateful that i i'm it didn't turn out like so bad i mean i'm walking now i biked down to the yard this morning or this afternoon to come here and talk to you so i mean it wasn't an easy recovery and it's not done yet but shit you know that thing could have hit me in the head and it could have been a totally different situation so yeah definitely yeah. You, you have to you have to feel you definitely have to feel lucky and look at the positive side that <clears throat> obviously you did get injured pretty severely but it could have been a, a hell of a lot worse. And also you had, you obviously had ground crew that are, are switched on and knowledgeable enough that they got you down in 15, 20 minutes. Cause that's pretty, that's a pretty speedy um, rescue time to like get you on the ground rather than, I mean, you imagine some crews that are working, the ground guys wouldn't even know what to do with and freak out. Um, some people would know what to do, but going to shock of seeing something happen. And like there's so many different scenarios that, that could play out there that it seemed like you, like, yeah, it worked out as good as what could have possibly happened once the incident had happened. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, that's, oh, you froze on me there, Dan. I'm oh, sorry. But, uh, no, you're, you're, you're right on point. I mean, it freaks the shit out of me to think of all the years that I climbed, you know, without like, without rescue training, without like a crew that could feasibly pull me out of those trees. Uh, 
and you know that was like there was like eight years there where I, I you know like I just I'm glad I, I'm glad if it were to happen I'm glad that you know it ha it happened what can you do but I, I'm glad it happened with the crew that I was with that day um, but I mean that said like I, it's since I've gotten here, uh, I think the quality of, of um, the, the climbers, I, uh, like I have a lot of faith in them. I mean, everybody who's come through seems pretty well trained. I, I don't know if it's just a Swedish thing. I think the European standards are pretty high and um, people do practice rescue uh, fairly often. And um, yeah, it's uh, something that, um, I, I just uh, like yeah it just scares me and uh, you know to think like there's a lot of people probably gonna like listen to this and, and know like uh, if push came to shove their ground guy might not be able to help them out and I think that's a real conversation that uh, they ought to have with their employer because like you know things can change in an instant so fast and things that you may think are safe or routine like you know can can knock you off your feet in a second and, yeah, and especially so. like you like you were saying um you know you just had a a newborn baby for like yeah. three weeks prior and so they must like i mean i'm i've not got any children and so i don't know that like what it would be like to be a new parent all i can look at is that i have very close friends that have had children and i I saw saw them in the hospital like three, four days later and then, you know, a week later and then a couple of weeks later. And for the first child, it looks like new parents are like deers in the headlight. They have no idea what's going on. Their whole world has just changed. They're getting next to no sleep. And But if you think about your colleagues, like your colleagues probably aren't going to realize what, you know, what you're, what you're going through. Um, so yeah yeah i mean like i guess it, you know if i am going to bring in an ounce of criticism uh on the whole thing and uh, i mean ultimately the climber i as the individual who took that responsibility that day to climb that tree i understand i bear the i bear the responsibility on this thing but if you are working with somebody that has gone through something like this or has gone you know has just had a child for Christ's sake. I mean, that's, you know, you got to keep a close eye on them. I, I was scrolling through Instagram the other day and um, I saw somebody had reposted something. I think it was like Mark Chisholm that posted where he's up in a tree and he says, uh, you know, I'm just like not on today. And like, I'm going to slow this thing right down. And this is like, that, that, that's a sort of like self-reflection that, you ought to have but it comes with experience often and if you don't have it you kind of need your colleagues to be able to point it out a little bit um i mean again like you know i can't blame any like there's no blame i'm super grateful for every every all that you know the assistance that i had that day and uh from those guys but um yeah i mean i should have I think like a team has to be able to understand when one of their members is uh, compromised yeah. by fatigue. Well, that's, by that's always that, that's always hard though as well because imagine yeah. if you you have you're going through a rough patch with your wife or your girlfriend, um, but you don't want to yeah. you don't want to talk about it with the guys at work because maybe you feel like you're not close enough with them or it's not the the thing that you want to air your dirty laundry. So you're harboring all this, um, you know, these arguments and stuff inside and you're thinking about it all day long. And it's similar to other situations. Uh, yeah. Like, like becoming a new parent, like you're, you're keeping all this, all this stress and tension and lack of sleep in, and you don't really want to bother your workmates with it. And so sometimes it can be like hard for them to, to see or hard for anybody to see what's going on with somebody else. And it, I suppose it takes you being like really good friends to be able to talk about it. And, um, that's definitely, it's definitely a tough one. Uh, what, um, yeah, how, how big was, 
how long and heavy was the piece that came down and struck you? Uh, I, I would I would think it was probably about five meters long and with a sort of like kind of caliper of 10 or 12 centimeters. Um, but the fact that it broke and was like a speed, it was basically on a speed line to my leg, if you understand, because I had another block there too. I, I, I really, I really botched the setup on this. And I think that's where a lot of the guilt came from. Like, why did I, like, what the hell was I thinking? Um, so in any event that that piece failed, it would have, it would have struck me. I, I, like when I think about it, like, do you understand? Like there was, yeah. So, so was that, was it the, um, was it what you would have classed like your primary rigging point or was it like the, almost like the redirected rigging point or were they two? It was the primary rigging point. And then, and then the, where I was, was like deflected off of that, which was supposed to just like be part of the redirect my angles were really bad that day though because that second rigging point was more or less i mean like there's gonna be people listening to this and you're just gonna be like you fucking idiot like but that's <laughs> what that's what happened and that's what it is and that's why i'm like you know i had that that second rigging point was almost horizontal and that's why when it fell it just like it fell into me and it it was only a few meters away but it came charging into my leg my leg was you know i had my spurs in so that's another thing i mean my spurs were (laughs) like you know gouged in this thing hit me from the side my leg had nowhere to go it was just like sitting right you know it's like fixed into position it absorbed a hundred percent of that impact and um i mean i'll get graphic here because i mean i think like graphic cells and you know i hope i want people to avoid this kind of thing but it struck my my femur like up by my hip and the the sort of the the meth the motive of, of a fracture was that my femur acted like a battering ram and blew through my tibial plateau if you follow me so the top of my the top of my my tibia shattered and the femur is a much bigger bone and a much stronger bone, so it didn't damage at all. The lower part, uh, something like 15 or 18 pieces of bone in there, like the whole corner of my knee was shattered and um, it was a lot of uh, reconstruction. So I was in the hospital for 10 days. Um, the first five days they couldn't do anything with me because the leg was so swollen and uh they had to put fixtures in which are terrifying as they sound it's like a brace they drill into your leg it's an external brace that keeps your leg from moving because they they had to transport me to a, a, a better hospital which is consequently the hospital that my wife works at um so they transferred me over there and uh much nicer room and good for friends res- visiting and i mean yeah, that those that was uh, that aftermath was kind of i mean it was as good as it could be given my situation i had a lot of people a lot of support from like stockholm tree community um just like great people showing up and and bringing me like little gifts and um herbal tinctures and things to get me back on track and uh yeah felt a lot of love that way and i it was a month before Christmas, so you know it's just like it's it's the it, everybody's kind of winding down that time of year, anyways, and like I think everybody was just kind of just I don't know very there's a lot of sympathy and and it felt good to have that support and and no one criticizing like you know I, like I was criticizing myself pretty hard, but like yeah just people coming and just being like super gracious and and uh and straightforward and yeah felt good but yeah then they fit then they did the surgery and i had a a hell of a time probably from the surgery which i think was about the 20th of november till uh 
end of end of January, the first two months were really they were the hardest. Of course, I you know I was practically uh, immobilized. I couldn't really use my leg. I lost a lot of muscle mass in my quad and my calf. And uh, then we went back to Canada um, at the end of January and we spent, which was initially supposed to be three months just to kind of be with family and, and uh, show off Luca and because both our parents are in Toronto. Uh, And we ended up staying for six months because COVID hit and we just didn't feel any desire to get back. And, so uh, I was on disability and my partner's on, on uh, parental leave and uh, we were just kind of just, I mean, it was a real silver lining to the whole thing. I mean, just being around family. And as soon as I could ride a bike again by March, I was just out riding my bike every day for an hour, an hour and a half and trying to get some, trying to build some strength back up again, trying to build some range of motion back up again. And, so it's been almost a year. I, uh, I'd say like the leg is probably 80% what it used to be. And I, I feel like there's a lot more to go, but I don't know how far it's going to go. I can almost, you know, I, I can't bend it all the way back anymore. But um, as far as for climbing goes, it's, uh, it's not so bad. And I've, I've done a bit of climbing since I've been back. I'm actually, on, I'm on parental leave now. Um, so like full time dad until until he goes to daycare in the new year. So I don't expect to go to back to work full time until the new year, but I am expecting to go back to work full time. And that's sort of like a deal I made with myself after the injury that I would try to get back. And that 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 took some shots. You know that I wasn't always so optimistic during the recovery that I would be able to do this job again. But then I'd say by by July. Uh, I started to feel kind of like an excitement about climbing and an excitement to get back into it. And I don't, I don't know where that stems from. It's just like coming back here and talking to some people and they're just like, you know, it's, it's more than a job. And I think you talk to a lot of people who would agree. And it's like, you know, what else am I getting? Like the industry is vast and there's so many things that I could like sort of um, diverge into and, and, and that's all great, and I expect to one day, but I am still, like, I'm 33 now, and um, I, I enjoy this. So if I can climb again for a couple more years or even just part-time for another 10, like, you know, I'm, that's, I'm excited about it. Yeah. And I often, and I feel it's, it's part of my recovery now, too. So I, I met with the surgeon a couple months ago. He was really... Oh, he was really impressed by things. He thinks, um, you know, the only thing left to do is go back to work. So, you know, and then I, I think I'll build a lot more strength just by doing the job again. I'm not that excited to do a, my first removal, but I imagine it's going to come. And, you know, I've, I, I've come out of this with like a real different sense of, I don't know, just like, yeah, just to take it, you know, there's no reason to, I mean, like, it's really just a job. Uh, So bearing all that stress about um, pulling something in for a day. I know it's like, it's easy to say in hindsight, but like, yeah, no, sorry, man. Maybe I'm just kind of like uh, rambling here, but yeah, no, nice. This is the, the thing that's really important. I think because I think the, I'd say definitely the majority of, of arborists, especially if you're working for somebody else, even if, when you work for yourself, you feel mm-hmm. like there's a, there's a time that's being allocated for a job. So say one job is like a, a one day job and you're like, right, I've got the whole day and we've got to get this job completed. And if you see it not going so well by like midday and you're like, you can't really see the end in sight. A lot, I think a lot of people, especially if you're the climber and you're the one that's actually doing the climbing portion of the work to get the material on the ground, you feel like you have that responsibility that you're the one to to bring the job in. And so yeah. it's not, it, yeah, it, it's not just rambling what you were saying. It's like that's a that's a genuine thought process. And but then once you've had an accident, like like you say you you can then sit back and reflect on everything and be like 
it is just a job. Why, why do I put so much pressure on, on myself? Because those pressures are like just a, a, day, a day pressure and then the next day has got a pressure and the next day has got a pressure. But then if you think about it, it's just, you're just going to work. It's just like if you worked in an office, would you put that yeah. same pressure on yourself? Maybe because if you had deadlines to meet, but there's not the risk involved that we yeah. have. So um, yeah. if, if, it, if it takes making a phone call to the person in charge or even making a, um, making a phone call to the client and saying, look, we're not going to get this finished, but we have work scheduled for the next few days. So it's going to be, a, I don't know, a week before we can come back or something. Then, and so for uh, as a business owner myself, I know that yeah. we shuffling the schedule around and making all these phone calls that are not ideal and that you feel a little bit like you're letting people down. It's tough, but it's um, it's certainly a better thing to do than than forcing yourself to push through and making mistakes and stuff. So, look, anyway, yeah, I suppose yeah. I suppose once you've once you've had an accident like yours that's one thing that will re like it will really shift your attitude towards like how you how you go forward in the future um whereas i th like i think it i think it's very hard to change your attitude if there there hasn't been any any of these kind of experiences that have happened to people because if you yeah. if somebody says look you need to slow down you need to take more time you need to not worry about pressure not worry about the boss um you're a, like a little erratic or whatever if 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 all those things are said to a person it's mm -hmm. going to be very hard for that person to just instantly change and be like right i'm i'm just going to slow down i'm going to think about everything you know carefully and methodically and like it's just if that person's has those traits in the first place they can't just instantly change overnight. Um, and I think it's through a lot of training and a lot of conversation with colleagues and stuff that maybe would change somebody over time. But um, I definitely, I definitely feel like <clears throat> from you, from you talking about this and you, you mentioned when you messaged me that you've, you've talked about it with a lot of people, a lot of friends now, I feel that's, that's going to do you the world of good because one going back to work, you'd have analyzed everything that happened so much in your head. And then probably with all the guys that you worked with that were on site that day, um, yeah. you, you've, you've seen where there was like maybe things that led up to mistakes, like lack of sleep and stress from the newborn. And, um, I don't know, just the, the kind of the airy vibe, the, the state of the yeah, tree yeah. there's so like so many things yeah. that you've probably analyzed and now when you go and do it like another removal you were saying oh i don't know it might be quite quite scary that the first time you do like a removal once you start climbing again but i i feel like your your senses will be so heightened that um then that's just going to be a good thing because you'll probably you'll probably look and and check all the the potential rigging points and you'll probably you'll probably double check yeah. all of your gear way more than you ever did before and and then i think that'll just become habit and, and that can only mm -hmm. be a good thing can't it? yeah I, I think you're i think you're i think you're spot on i mean like there's only so much you can actually explain to people um uh, you know i i think if you asked me a year ago today i would have said like damn I'm, I'm i work safe i'm like you know i've got good training i take my time I, you know i've i've got other things besides work that i that i like live for you know i'm not i'm not trying to you know i, I joke that i was like trying to be a euro ace but that's like half a lie like i was really just you know trying to adopt some good techniques and this and that right but uh and uh and wear like high vis saw pants and you know, a bit of a divergence from my uh, BC tree days of woolly sweaters and plaids uh, to high vis and um, and spandex, but uh, uh, but yeah, like no, you know, I, I didn't I didn't see my and I, it's like something that one of my uh, colleagues is really hung up on, like in the hospital that I was saying, like I just didn't imagine 
like this happening to me and it's so it's not it's not entirely true i don't know why i said that but it, it must there must be i must have had that sense like when i was under morphine that i i don't know i guess you always think of the risk but i had been working for nine years uh without a substantial injury and i think you get a little bit callous to the the dangers in a way you start to mm. think like you know it's it becomes a bit routine and there's nothing routine about removing an old like half rotten tree i mean it's just always going to have a thousand variables that you've never that you didn't consider and uh if you don't approach it with a clear head you're just asking for trouble and uh so yeah i mean i, I didn't think, remember sorry i was just gonna say that, like, oh yeah oh, no, go on. no i just think when i was in humber and i was like really starting out and i was fresh and i remember one of the instructors was saying like you know a lot of the injuries they happen at eight year, like eight years is sort of like a kind of a milestone um at that point uh you know you're just starting to get a bit complacent and if I start to, if I really analyze it, like, yeah, maybe I hadn't been climbing hardcore like for eight years, but I, I just been do, getting up and going to work and doing this job in some capacity for eight or nine years. And yeah, I kind of hit that window in a way. But I mean, I, there are other variables, but yeah. Anyway, sorry about that. What were you saying there? Yeah, I was going to say, um, when you, you said you were in hospital and you were like, I, I just didn't think this was going to happen to me. Um, I, yeah. that's, that's not, um, that's not a strange sort of thing to think because I think, I think every, like almost everybody, uh, would think, would hear stories of different people having accidents, injuries. Um, and they'll be like, Oh, that I can't see that happening to me. I've used a chainsaw for, you know, 10 years, I've been climbing for 10 years. I've, I've, you know, I've never fallen out of a tree. I've never cut myself. I've never cut my chainsaw pants. I've never cut my rope. I've never like, if, if that's the way you think, you're always going to think this will never happen to me. It's when you start yeah. thinking this could happen to me. I think it, it's when you start being more careful with like your daily practices and your, um, just the way that you climb and the, the decisions that you make, because yeah. if, if you take all those like really small little close calls that you've had and you actually think about them and you think, right, if that had gone bad, how bad could it have been? Then that puts it into context of how often things can happen. Um, right. whereas if you have a close call and you just kind of just brush it off and be like, Oh, that was close. And then never think about it again. Um, sure. that's, yeah, that's, that's really bad because you eventually something is going to happen if you just keep being complacent. And I, but I feel like it's so hard to change people's mind on any of their techniques. If they've been say if you've been in the career for like for 15, 20 years, and oh somebody, oh somebody yeah. seems somebody sees you working and it's like, oh, that's you're doing that unsafely. You should do it this way. They're they're never gonna be open to that because they'll they'll think, oh, well, I've done it for 15 years and it's never happened. So it's it's one of those things that until something does happen to you, it's like if you most people would be of the the mindset that that will never happen to me. It'll all, it always happens to somebody else. It'll never happen to yeah. me. Um, I think that's it's just, become, hu I think that's just human nature, isn't it? Like in all walks yeah. of life, if you've never had a car crash, you'll probably think, Oh, that's, I'm never going to have a car crash. Um, yeah. Or it's, yeah. But oh God, like in our business, Dan, when you think about, I mean, this becomes a really untenable position to hold, like after a while, like rationally, like, you know, you do 10 years in this business and how many injuries, fatalities, not only just happen elsewhere in the industry abroad or wherever, but like in your hometown or where you're working, like it really starts to add up and you have to think like these guys aren't just, you know, it's, this isn't some kind of, um, yeah, it's, it exists at such a high rate. And, um, 
some of the best and brightest in the industry, uh, it happens to them too. And, uh, you know, it's humbling. Uh, one of the, one of the really humbling moments after, I think it was like in early December, I had a bunch of guys over to my house, um, Stockholm Arborists and, um, guys and ladies too, I should say. I mean, some uh, and, and everybody had a, a lot of people started telling stories about accidents that they'd had and some of them had been really bad, like that I'd never heard, you know, and I'd worked with these people and or worked closely or worked with co people who had worked with them. And, and like people were telling me about times they fell out of trees and like had to take three months off because they broke a, you know, popped a disc in their back. and. People told me about, uh, you know, one of my friends had broken his leg uh, and he just felt like he didn't want to talk about it. And I mean, I think if you do start to dig, like there are a lot of injuries in this job. I mean, it might not be uh, like some really um, dramatic. Uh, what I feel like what happened to me was like just hanging from a tree for 15, 20 minutes waiting to get rescued but like you know you get muscular skeletal things and you know all these mm. things add up and uh, yeah the risk is is major and uh hey like but you know we're all passionate about it and like i had this thing happen and and one of the overriding thoughts in my head is to get back to it so i don't know what <laughs> what, what that says about me but i mean i think it says a lot about all of us like we accept this level of of risk and uh we constantly work to reduce that risk but that risk is ever present like yeah, yeah. The, i mean the, the there's always going to be the the a certain amount of risk there like with the job we do that's that's just that is the nature yeah. of the job and it's it's up to us and you know for our own self preservation how we work to mitigate that risk in all of our pra daily yeah. practices, all of our like education of trees and structure and but yeah, yeah but those 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 the nature of the job with the risk that it comes is that we're dealing with you know trees that you know they're not they're not a man made thing we can't they can't be certified with a certain amount of strength yeah. and so we have to try and well we have to use our knowledge don't we really and it's um, yeah and yeah I, I you never know how many times some people get lucky and the and like it like in your situation maybe maybe some people might have done very very similar thing on a similar tree and their rigging point held and maybe another another few times of rigging off of it it would have completely uh, it would have failed but maybe they got away with it and mm -hmm. it's like it's just those like i don't know yeah those those really small things isn't it? um there's yes. a what well, one one more question i had for you actually was you whereabouts were you tied into were you tied into the stem that failed or were you tied no. into something different? i was tied into an adjacent piece that was like unharmed in this whole um uh, in this whole situation so it was going to be the last piece i took down on the tree it was the most central uh large part of the structure so now the my my access or my uh, working system was fine i was hanging in that along with i was hanging in my my um lanyard as well so i that wasn't you know that wasn't where the um like i was quite well secured i just happened to have a massive branch pinning my leg down um so when i was working with this saw like i was trying to be very cautious of where my conscious of where my ropes were um but uh yeah yeah i i mean you never want to put yourself in uh you never want to put yourself in a in the path of of uh what would you say like the the path of failure i suppose and, and i think that's where i made a real categorical 
error in in putting that second piece of rigging device i mean hell like when i think about it like what i should have done on that piece is just uh you know within my abilities and within the time frame that i had given was just let that piece go it wasn't worth it you know it was a small little bush like you know it's it wasn't worth putting myself at risk for chances are we could you know had had i had a little more planning would have just dug the thing up and moved it or something right you know, you can, I can always think back at all the different little things. Yeah, there can, there's, always, there's always a way that you can think that you yeah. would have done it differently. But there's a, those, are, well, those are the things that are going to beat you, that you're going to beat yeah. yourself up about, aren't they? So those, are, those kind of things, I think, are maybe to a certain point, you need to stop thinking about mm. what you could have done. Oh, yeah. Because it yeah, it's happens. done. It's done. Yeah. yeah. It's... And, uh, uh, it's do you know what's what's terrifying i'll i'll say this because it's like so fresh in my mind is um i don't know if you will have heard or not or seen on social media but there's a guy on vancouver island who just passed away on tuesday um and i don't know i i think i i well i think i know a, a quite an accurate description of what happened now because of who i've spoken to but um, okay. it sounds like very very similar to what happened to you but um, I, he, I saw that you had posted that and like yeah my my heart dropped through the floor i just like it gives yeah yeah please like tell me i mean i yeah what do you feel comfortable telling or do you uh, I, I mean able? i don't wanna, I, I don't want to go into no. to it too much because I, I i okay i have like second hand information it's good information yeah, but, yeah. um yeah I then maybe th maybe I just keep it yeah, I don't think all the details are, are fully known yet, but yeah. um, it was a it was a rigging failure. Um, like the the point of the the rigging point failed pretty similar yeah. to what happened to you. Uh, and I I'm all, like I've been told that much, and um, obviously hit hit the guy in a way that that yeah killed him. So it's. Uh, it, but it's it's yeah. it's pretty it, well. It's very it, for me. I I hadn't uh, met him, and I knew he worked for a friend of mine uh, a couple of really? days a, a couple of days a week, and then he worked for another company um, a few days a week mm -hmm. as well. So, and because it so that brings it very close to home for me. The fact that I knew well, he's it, he's physically close in in distance because he's on vancouver yeah. island and then finding out that he worked for my friend like contracted to my friend a couple of days a week and then knowing people that have been involved in going to the the location to try and see like almost like investigate the aftermath and see if they can figure out exactly what happened and um yeah it's all it's all become pretty real and when when things happen like close to home and for like friends of friends and people that you know and stuff it's uh dude yeah it's pretty yeah i know pretty, it, yeah. I, know, well, I, I, know. I, I feel it i mean no sometimes like i just shake sometimes it really does frustrate me but i, I know that's you know, with, with this sort of path in, in life, uh, you know, who else like working at a bank or working at a restaurant, like knows so many colleagues uh, and knows so many stories of this nature. I mean, it's like such a, I mean, mortality, like it's just something people don't really even want to talk about in other sections of society. But I feel like it's something that rears its head constantly in, in ours. And um, I don't know, maybe that's healthy on some level. Maybe like it's good that people talk. And I think that we're talking right now and hopefully people can listen and, and people have these conversations because uh, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful career and, and it's, it's an, it's a duty of everybody who does it to talk about these things and, you know, we were, you were saying earlier, like, you know, I know that feeling of working with people who are, are all, who are guarding something, you know, and, but one of the things I love about this job is it does endear you to like some people you didn't even think you'd 
ever have con like anything really in common with, but you work together every day for months and like you start to see their side of the, the their side of things and you see different perspectives and uh, people's personal struggles and uh, you know, you have to make the best of that and, and, and being there for each other. I mean, we spend more time with each other than we do with our own partners. Most of the time we're there. These are our closest, the closest people in our lives is our colleagues and our groundsmen and our climbers. And it's like that, that, that's, a, that, that's special, you know, we have camaraderie on a different level. So um, being able to talk about all things, not just like the fun things and, and the light things, but being able to talk about all things, it must lead to some, I hope it leads to some like, you know, broader consciousness of what we're, in you know what we yeah. do yeah and, and and going back to that that's uh to your point of of talking about it um so we're we're recording this on a sunday and um, like i said the um the the young guy eddie his name was eddie mather um he's the guy that died on vancouver island who's an australian guy and uh, I'm just going to like, I really want to make a point to sit down with the guys that I work with and just, just talk about everything surrounding the way that we do things and the communication that we need to have. And, and yeah, like picking up on if we feel like anybody's having a hard time outside of work and that they're bringing their, their stresses and problems. And also like, you know, looking out for each other, if somebody's not spotted something, um yeah. whether it be a tree defect or whether it be a defect in their climbing equipment and because sometimes like even if you're even if you're you feel like you're on it you're having a good day sometimes you can miss things and if if everybody is always on point on on site or it, maybe somebody's not and the other the other two or three guys are are aware of stuff um I think that's so important that you're always talking and you're and and you're not afraid to to try and well to to point out if somebody's doing something wrong and just say look I don't think this is safe and um and not have the culture of like you then say something to maybe somebody more experienced cuz you think they'll take it the wrong way and like you're trying to show them that yeah you know, that's a tough, that's stuff. a tough one sometimes right I mean talk uh, I think that sort of hierarchy, uh, I think I, I, I trust that you're going to be like, you're going to be a really good boss about these kinds of things because you are a communicator. But I mean, I think we both know bosses uh, from earlier in our career who operated on a different structure of silence and, uh, you know, keep your feelings to yourself and come to work and get in line and strict hierarchies and like that stuff. I mean, that's, it, it was, it's of a, it's of a time, but that doesn't lead to positive change. Uh, you know, um, like I just, it's sad that that's, there's, it's probably still exists in some parts of the industry where oh, without a doubt, like to yeah. toughen up, man up. Like that just doesn't, that's, I mean, first of all, like you just, never going to bring any respect to the industry by using terminology like that. And, um, also you're just, you're just making the, the workplace like far less safe. Uh, so yeah, talking to people like, I like, like one thing I can say about, uh, where, where I work is it is a very, we have, we bring a lot of really talented, uh, climbers come through the doors here. Um, you know, it's one of the beauties of the, the European system. I mean, really, uh, that people can travel and work abroad, and uh, the 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 European tree scene is like pretty endearing. Like yeah. all the van lifers and and the, uh, the you know and, and the community that that fosters. Um, but people come in, and I know they're good. I know they're hot shit, but they're really nice, and they all just want to be part of the team. You know, and everybody just listens to one another and and learns from one another, and it's. Uh, I mean, it's a real nice experience because I know like some places that I've been in the past, I worked in the past, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know, the hot shot pulls up and gets the tree down, drives away and you're like, okay, cool. Great to work with the best guy in town. Like what? That doesn't, you know, yeah. 
that doesn't help anybody. Like I actually, um, I I met a guy. Well, when we worked at Bartlett, there was a guy Mick who worked at Nordic. Yeah, uh, did, yeah, Mick. Did, did you know him? He's the good shit. He's a Belgian guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw him. Uh, well, actually, I haven't seen him. I haven't heard from him in a couple of years. But Mick, yeah, one of my other colleagues yeah. here, he keeps in touch. And he's uh, awesome. Yeah. Mick was a character. We went climbing in in Penticton together uh, when he was there. We right. went down to to Skaha, and he was pretty funny because he pitched his tent that night and woke up and there was snow on it, and he was just, you know was like freaking out. What the fuck? There's snow all over the place. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then I saw him again at Augsburg. Um, it, there's a big tree convention in Augsburg, Germany, and we went down there the first year that I was here. We went down and. Mick showed up with a bunch of Belgians, like dreadheads uh, from, uh, I don't know, like Belgium, I suppose. I don't know. <laughs> they just road trip <laughs> down. It was just like, but it was just really cool because I, I think sometimes the tree scene in, in North America becomes like, it's a little bit more, uh, uh, I mean, it's definitely good in parts and it's really accepting, but I know some parts are very like, it's very gear and or very machine oriented and, it's a yeah. bit of a lumberjack vibe here. It's like very, it's, it's a little more laid back, I'd say. I mean, the climbing events here are just wonderful. Like it's like full family affair, but it's the same back in Canada. I shouldn't be making this distinction. It's, it's just the uh, nuance. There's, there's definitely, definitely differences though. The lifestyle, the amount of, the amount of people that travel around and work for different people, it happens way more in Europe. Like, Oh, that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't really happen here. You don't get people turning up for three, four months at a time in, in their camper well, van. And then do you going remember on. when Mick showed up? And I remember Darren was just like, yeah, I think he wanted to work for a month. And Darren's like, you either take employment or you walk. Like, what is this come for a month shit? Like, <laughs> but for him, he was just like, hey, you know, I'm here. I want to work. I've got the key. You know, I, I can do the job. And I get where he's coming from now. I didn't at the time. I was, that's pretty bold. You just kind of pull up and ask for a month's work. But like, but yeah, it's a different culture. Eh? People come <laughs> and go. And yeah, I love it. I mean, it's really nice. I, I, uh, I mean, I've been pretty, I've been pretty rooted in the city, but I've also, I've got to enjoy a lot of people coming through. So yeah. Um, yeah. Perhaps one day I'd get, I'd like to go down to Hamburg uh, maybe next winter it's quite a that's quite a hub um for the people out here so yeah um yeah, it would be nice to go down and work with some of those guys so nice one jeff well yeah, um i'll i'll let you go and, and enjoy the rest of your evening but uh really appreciate yeah. you like yeah kind of sharing your story and yeah, yeah. I really, like i really hope you get back into climbing and you enjoy it just as much as you did and but maybe with a slightly different like mindset which will hopefully be more beneficial for you in the future so yeah 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 and i i mean you know what the thing is too with this job is like climbing is one aspect it's it's a very it's like a very vast industry right and i think if you have a passion for trees um it doesn't end at climbing like there's so much more so i even when i thought maybe i couldn't climb i knew i was going to stay in the industry somehow and yeah you know so that's it is like it is a good it is a good uh a good place to be and uh wouldn't really trade it for anything so but yeah i mean good conversation got a little bit heavy there and i uh but i think that's the way it ought to be you know shouldn't shy away from definitely the occasional heavy yeah. chatter so yeah Great, make sure good to make see sure you again make sure yeah. you make sure your little boy is always front of your mind whenever you're going to make any decisions yeah that's that'll be a that's a good one to have isn't it when you think oh totally, maybe man. Sh should i should i do this or should i maybe climb a little higher and, and do something smaller but yeah that's yeah uh, it's always good well, it's, it's like it's a cliche but like every it, it changes your world and it, there's no doubt about it and it affects every everything I do now. So, um, but yeah, I guess uh, give a shout out to all the boys back there, the the Georges and Tiger and Isaac and Petey and Elliot and everyone Definitely. else. Definitely. Right. Nice Cheers. one. Cheers, Jeff. Okay. Speak to you later. Take care.